Today on The Nightlife, questions for your DM. I'm gonna find out what questions my players have for me. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Nightlife. We appreciate you joining us, and we're glad if you've managed to like, subscribe, or comment on any of our videos. We really, really appreciate you. And to our patrons who are supporting us, thank you very, very, very much. You all mean the world to us. So we've produced a number of content, uh, a bunch of content over the last couple uh, of weeks here, ranging on topics from 5th edition to Pathfinder, Sandbox to Adventures. Uh, but today, I thought I would kind of turn that over to my players. What questions do you have for me? And it can be about anything, but basically, I just want to be able to answer your questions. And I'd love to answer all of your questions. And if you are interested in asking me questions, feel free to check out our Patreon. We have a number of limited uh, uh, access events involving live Q&As with the Knights, individual sessions with me for GM or DM advice. So check that out if you're interested. But today, as a proxy, I thought I'd ask my players, what would you like to know more about? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm running Age of Ashes. Okay, sessions. I've heard it's very hard. I have heard that too. I've heard that they... they, mess, they It was the first adventure path written. Yep. They didn't understand really how their system worked yet. So I actually have a great question. So I think they, and, fuck, and, and, I think I, they fucked up the math. Well, that's my... <laughs> okay, so here, this is the question. I am a new GM. Yeah. Derek. Yeah. Very experienced DM GM. Yeah. I'm running Age of Ashes. I got four players. Yep. That's your standard array. Sure. How do I know? Just make everything weak. Just make everything weak. So do you just know take their means? level down? No. Do you know what weak means? No, I don't. So in Pathfinder 2, there are two easy templates that you can apply to any monster. The GMG kind of even talks about maybe applying them in the middle of a fight. If like you think that maybe the monster's too tough or the monster's too weak. but um, Sounds like fudging. Yeah, it's a little bit like fudging. <laughs> well, but, I mean, I'm new, so I'm just kind of little. Yeah, yeah. And I heard they might have messed this one up. So, so what weak does, messed it, it, it kind of like, it's like a default of setting that you can apply to any monster. It takes about... I think it takes two points off their attack roll, uh, lowers their hit points by like, you know, 10% or so, and their damage by minus two. You said attack twice. Is it AC? Did you mean in there too or no? I'm sorry. Attack and AC. Okay. Their saves. Basically, it takes everything down by two. It's like, okay. it's like they're permanently frightened too. Okay. And uh, yeah. So now, so here's the thing. Because that'll make, well, number one, if the game, if the challenges in that adventure are overtuned and they're just too tough, it'll make that easier. And two, you're playing with very in inexperienced gamers. Yes, I am playing with almost two brand new people. I mean, yeah, two, two, well, two newbies and two, two average novices. Right. Yeah, novices. And, and so, uh, you know, so number one, the game, the adventure itself might be poorly written in terms of its actual balance. But number two, if you're playing with, you know, less experienced players, just make it easier on them. I just want to fight know? a dragon and this thing goes to a dragon to fight. And I think that's really sweet. <laughs> well, you don't have to play an entire adventure path in order I to know. fight a dragon. So that's, that's the other thing. It's like, I don't even know if I should be running session zero or if I should just ramp us up and let's go fight, you know. I forget what his name is in this adventure, but I'm not. I, I I've read through some of the adventures. There's, but a, there's a Whiz Kids. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that dragon. I recommend boosting the levels of new characters. No, never to try a fight. Uh, new players, especially. Yeah, DM Derek says if at all possible, start at level one, and better to start at level one and level once a session than to uh, ramp it up to twenty right away. Yeah, right. And especially <laughs> with new players, right? They have a lot to handle. Yeah, I mean, I always see those cool things called um. Epic, epic fights or epic encounters. I don't know what it's called. It's a D and D five E product by a, a company, and it has a one shot. But it isn't really a one shot because it can last multiple, se multiple sessions. But it has a straight line. You are going to fight the dragon, and yeah. it has everything for you. It, it also seemed really cool for a, a, an adventure. But I thought Age of Ashes because of where it was going to lead to was really cool for us to play. No, and I very, just get really nervous when I'm yeah. looking at the adventure, going, I don't even know. Enough yeah. to know if this is too hard, too easy, too anything. Right. It's always better mm -hmm. <laughs> to have it be too easy than have it be too hard. If it's too hard, the players will feel so frustrated. None of their spells will land. They'll miss all the time. They'll feel like they're constantly getting hit or crit. Their characters might be down a lot, which means they don't get to take any actions. It'll be very, very frustrating for them. If it's a little bit too easy, they'll kick ass and take names. Yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, I just and you can always do, like do, as the group decides. Okay, we know what's going on now. You know, remove uh, that weak. Remove template. the weak template, and then say, okay, we'll give them the full the full Monty. You know, but yeah, I mean, I don't want you to have to fudge. But you're a new DM. 
their new players. You know, there may be, a, and I think I said this in comments. I think it's different than fudging, right? It's it's you're talking about like an adventure that might be written. Yeah. So a little I, well, and wrongly. I said that I said that in our fudging video here uh, in the comments. I wish I would have said this during the video, which is, I think the only time it's appropriate to fudge is when you realize you or the people who wrote your adventure made a terrible mistake, and that whatever you've created for this encounter or this adventure is just way too difficult and way too over you know powered, and it it wasn't fair, right? You should always strive to be fair. You know, to put the players into a situation where there's no chance to escape and they didn't even realize that, yeah, that might be realistic. That happens to people, right? Like, oh, I drove off the edge of the cliff and now I'm going to crash into the ground and die. But like in a game, that's not very interesting, right? Games are interesting when you get to make interesting choices. And if players don't really have an interesting choice to make, then that's not really fun. Yeah. So I, I just lower them, you know, lower I lower. think it's a great idea. I just, I, It'll make it I at, knew that was at me worst. Uh, They'll they'll have an easier time with things, but I think they're gonna have a hard time with things anyway. So I think that's what right. I'm hearing. Yeah, we'll eventually get to play that, Nick. Don't worry. Yeah, no, I get you. Yeah. What else? Anything else? It could be about it could be about our game. It could be about uh, role playing games in general. What do you prefer better or more? I should say, being the game master or oh. the player. Oh, that's tough. I I can answer this for Derek honestly. Uh oh. Like, if we're being honest. No, no, please. Please. Derek prefers being a game master. Sure. And why? here's why. Okay. okay. Right? I know the why, right? Very oh. important motivation. I could role play Derek. All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Check, check out our last video yeah. here where we talked about motivation That's as right. the key to role play. I could role play as Derek in this case, and here's why. And <laughs> it's interesting because he's never outright said it while DMing Dungeons & Dragons. But one time during an ultimate werewolf game, he said his true motivation for why he likes to be the GM. He loves to know everything that's going on and see how the players interact with it. Yeah. It's I, one of his favorite things. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna probably answer that question, which is this. Um, I love to see how everything fits together. As a player, I always feel so frustrated because I don't understand what's going on. And you know, you're so limited in understanding the full picture. I like to understand the full picture, all of the different motivations. If you've ever read a Pathfinder Adventure Path, you know that there's so much content in there about why the villains are who they are and what their backstory was and how it was like when they're growing up. And the players encounter them and they kill them in like three or four rounds, and you, you know, none of that ever matters. I like to know that stuff. You know, I like to be surprised. I like for the players to surprise me by what they do, but I love to understand the big picture. I'm a big picture guy. And so I feel as a player, a lot of times I feel out of the loop. I feel misinformed. I feel like there are things moving around me that I don't fully comprehend and that I don't fully understand. And I don't have the power to trifle with. I don't like that. I don't like that. Oh, I kind of like that. I want, <laughs> I want to unsolve, I want to uns, unsolve, I want to solve that mystery. <laughs> yeah. A great example. I don't read mystery books because when I used to read them, I'd read like three or four or five pages, make a guess about who I thought did it, flip to the end of the book to see if I was right. <laughs> God, you're awful. <laughs> I don't like puzzles either. What, what oh, was your win percentage? And, and, <laughs> I was like, yeah, exactly. How many times did you guess right? Oh, a good chunk. You know, I, I, Too I, smart for I, your own I always piss off my girlfriend <laughs> because we'll be in a movie and like, you know, like 10 minutes in, I'll be like, I bet it was him. And then, like the end of the movie, it's like, it was him. And, you know, yeah. and you're like, she's like, how did you okay, know well, that? Good. I, Have you ever been surprised by a movie then? By a movie surprising yeah. me, like yeah. like a, a, like a total a, twist that like just, a total twist that really threw you off. Yeah, that you never saw coming. Oh man, that's a great question. That's well, I just because just because you said that, Nevada. I'm like thinking like, okay, well, if you're guessing 90 percent right, which one? Like, where you were like, oh, I would never have guessed that. Wow, that's a great question. Or maybe a book. It's maybe been, maybe it, a book. It, it's been so long since I've uh, seen a movie. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> since I've seen uh, a yeah. movie, I wasn't being sarcastic. Guys. No, no, no. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really been so long since I've seen a movie. Uh, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I'll, well, get back to the people maybe in the comments about yeah, that. I, I'll leave a pinned comment if I can think about what it. What about uh, uh, Endgame? No, that totally had, expected. Totally expected. All right. Yeah, and that that ended the way it had to end yeah, because. Yeah. Of character arcs. That's right. <laughs> now we went through this with Lord of the Rings. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, Tony Stark's arc was, I am the selfish billionaire philanthropist. Captain America tells him in Avengers 1, you're yep. not the kind of guy to make the sacrifice play to lay down on the wire, right? So in order for Tony to complete his arc, he had to prove that. Absolutely. And more important than that, he realized, I have a daughter now. I have a child. Like, there's something greater than me mm -hmm. that I now have the ability to sacrifice myself to do. Just, it's funny to hear you talk about arcs because, again, this is off topic, but I'm like, 
I don't even see the arcs. I'm like, look at that sweet thing that just happened. <laughs> You're like, did you know the arc about that guy? I'm like, nah. Yeah. Didn't even think about it. No. It was just badass. Which goes back to the last video about my character motivations. I only see like <laughs> straight at it. Right. Now, to be fair, I, I don't think that when you when you when you're a novelist, you should absolutely plan out, okay, I've written this character into this, you know, into this show or into this movie or into this series. I know where he is, I know where she's going, I know where she's gonna end up. But as a player, I don't think you should do that. Okay, when you sandbox, um, yeah. Because that's mostly what you do. You don't usually run these APs. I know you like to plan one venture, adventure ahead. No, I like to plan one session ahead. One session, sorry. One session ahead, sorry. Yeah. Miss, yeah. Miss said. But do you have any overarching themes? Well, no. What I do is or I- do you like to back? No. What back I grab? do. What I do is I try to look at the picture, the big picture, and I say, okay, there's a thieves guild. And- the last couple of sessions, the group has been uh, attacking the Thieves Guild, running them out of town, okay? And they succeeded. They won. The adventurers won the day. Okay, cool. All right. Well, the Thieves Guild isn't destroyed, or maybe the Thieves Guild serves a higher master. Now, I don't have a motivation. I don't have a skin in the game. I'm not like this Thieves Guild has to survive because they're going to be the big villain at the end of the adventure. I don't care. But I think to myself, I said, if I ran a Thieves Guild, and a group of high-level adventurers came into a town and chased out my people from that town and, and put them on the run and, you know, arrested them or killed them, what would I do? I don't know. These guys are probably problematic. Maybe I try to buy them off. Mm. Maybe I try to get them to work for me. Maybe I send hired killers after them, which do I think would have a better chance of working? Maybe I'll find out some information about them first. Yeah, okay, that works. And then maybe a meeting happens. Or you're sitting in an inn and suddenly like, you know, everybody gets, starts getting up and then like a bunch of like really big, huge hulking dudes come in and a guy comes in and he says, greetings. Hi, that was really impressive what you did. Uh, you know, we, we, we could use people like you of your talents. And you say, what do you mean? I represent uh, certain interests who would love to uh, acquire your talents. And maybe they hire you to do some horrible thing that you don't even know is horrible. Mm. They tell you some lie. Been there. And you're a gullible <laughs> par party member. So you go, oh, cool, new adventure. And then you find out that for the last, you know, 10 weeks, you've been working for the Evil Thieves Guild that you helped run out of the town. Oh, that's some, that's some interesting so stuff sets, there. He sets the twist. <laughs> no, I'm not setting the twist. I'm saying, what would I do if I, it, that's my version of GM role playing. Okay. Right. Makes sense. It, it, I go, I'm this villain. I'm this kingdom i'm this monster what would i do hmm. the players just kicked in my teeth and took names or or i look at a better thing maybe that villain is dead but that leaves a power vacuum who's going to fill that vacuum in the city the thieves guild they're destroyed you you ran them to the ground well what there's never going to be crime in that city again no something's going to come up turns out that the thieves guild as evil as they were were also keeping the powerful were rats that live in the sewers at bay and without the thieves guild to keep them at bay. You know, it's like the old thing where it's like, you know, you, you kill the coyotes to, you know, to save the deer and then the deer become huge and eat all the grass and then the grass dies. And so, you know, it's like these chain reactions, everything. And then the butterfly players, effect. Like, yes. butter, that's it, butterfly yeah, effect. So, so players start to go, wait a second. It's like, it's like the things that we do have consequences mm -hmm. and it's like, whatever we do ripples and affects future events weird <laughs> right and then it's like oh wait this isn't just a story this is like a real world with real consequences right like if you watch game of thrones red wedding is horrible but that wasn't just out of nowhere it made total sense if you watched the show i couldn't nope. sleep for days after that movie after that scene okay but my point is it the the groundwork for that was laid in countless events that led up to that moment and when that moment happens, you go, yeah, that makes total sense. It did. But I, it shook me to the core. Sure. <laughs> right. Which is fine. Yeah, right. But I, I'm you, I the story did days. its job. <laughs> I right. know. That hit me hard. The best twists are the ones where you go, I never saw that coming, but it makes total sense. Absolutely. Yeah, still yeah. waiting for you to figure out that twist right. that you don't that know about. That was the question that we started <laughs> with. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then on the flip side. Okay. Okay. You, I got one. I oh, got one. Okay. okay. I got it. I got it. What? Okay. Spoiler alert. Oh, gosh. For the movie The Prestige. 
Oh, oh yes. so such good. a good yes. movie! All Absolutely. of that movie. Oh yes, <laughs> there that you go. movie was very good. Fair. That Absolutely. movie, Fair. that movie destroyed me. And as it was painting the picture of every little scene where, again, spoiler alert, where uh, Borden was two people. Mm-hmm. Like little. Sometimes you mean it. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, you don't. Sometimes yes. you say you love me. All you mean. the foreshadowing. All, like, oh, phenomenal. your fingers. It's like they're not healing. Uh, it's like they're freshly injured. Yeah. Right. Like everything about that movie blew me away. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was a, it was a well done movie. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. I did not see that coming at all. I, was, no. I love I was, that you did. I was so focused on the Hugh Jackman character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And his obsession. Insane thing. His obsession. Well, and it we, helped that they had like three, four major, amazing actors and actresses oh, play. Oh, yeah. That helps still, just yeah. crushing the roles. But but I was but so the story was phenomenal. But I was so focused on the Hugh Jackman character that I I failed to pick up on all of these incredible D moments mm-hmm. of the Albert Borden character. Right, and it just destroyed me. Yeah. Love it. I just sat love there it. thinking about it for days. And days. Oh, I love it. Like yeah, that's good. Yeah. So that was, was it. Good. I mean, that's, a, that's an older movie, but that no, one, that's that's still yeah. a great one. That good one, pick. that one definitely got me. So. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, anyways, um, so yeah. Anything else before your DM? So here's an interesting question that I know you know we have encountered before, but at what point do you make a choice between the story and the game mechanics? Mm-hmm. And why? So the example that I'm basing this question off of for the viewers is a long time ago, we played an Eberron campaign and there was a villain. He was, I think he was a vampire. This is a third edition. Third edition. Yeah. Yep. Eberron third edition. And he was a vampire. And part of the whole thing was the sword that he had was some magical sword that was like corrupting his mind and making him like do certain things and be even more evil than he was. So Sunder rules exist in Pathfinder. And we started Sundering the sword, trying to break it. Which we successfully did. Now, narratively, this villain was supposed to escape and be the villain for the rest of the adventure. I know the decision Derek made, which was the mechanic, because he knows our party very well. This, but well, I, a Nagulus of party. I'm curious. Like, well, I think I think well, I think you answered it in two ways. One is as me, Derek. I would say again, I, and I've said this before a million times. Uh, the best thing about playing role playing games is for your players to be able to make choices. And decisions, and two, to have those decisions or choices matter. A lot of times, players are making a lot of decisions and choices, but none of them matter, right? Or a lot of times, they're just not making decisions and choices. So, I want players to have agency, and I want the things that they do to have effects. So, Derek says, "Okay, if the players use the logic and the rules of the game to accomplish some task." And it's not completely outrageous. It's not like a crazy hairball scheme that has very little chance of working despite what they might think. Then, yeah, that works. And I would rather, this is me, Derek, I would rather end, essentially, that adventure than rob my players of that experience. Now, don't get me wrong. Some, you know, The mistake would be to punish your players for that. If you're like an hour into the adventure, you're like, and they break the vampire sword with the sun- thunder is an attack where you attack their weapon. And you're like, oh yeah, they're sword, the sword is sundered. He's broken. I'm like, okay guys, well, good job. Go home. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Adventure's over. You know, I'm punishing them for beating the adventure. That did not happen when we did it. No, <laughs> but I will say this. I think what you just said though, at the end of your question is the correct answer. So I know what I would do but that may not be the correct answer. Right. The correct answer is what would be best for your group? I know that our group want would be fine. I, they would be fine with me closing the book and saying, you guys did it. Well done. That's accurate. Okay. <laughs> I, w- I would have been totally fine with that. <laughs> yeah. Because you would rather have control and power and agency than, uh, what about the cool story? Yeah. But there are groups who, if they did something and the DM let it happen, and then they won, but in a very anticlimactic or not cool way, would be like, I'm disappointed. Right. I wanted it to be an uphill slog the whole way, culminating in a very appropriate, dramatic fight on a lightning-scarred tower top. The way it was written. The way it was written. <laughs> and if you have a problem with running a game like that, then you shouldn't be running that game. But if your group is really into that and you're really into that, then yeah, do that. You know, again, I, I mean... I think that that people 
do use the excuse of whatever makes the most fun. No. But the problem is like, that's not how right. do you even know what the most fun like, is? Uh, because mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example. If you're teaching your kid how to play a game and you say, what is going to make this experience the most fun for everyone? Okay. Cheat and let them win. Because if they lose, they are going to cry. And it's not, it's not going to be fun for me. It's definitely not going to be fun for them. So I I'm, win all the time. Pretty, pretty princess. Okay. Crush that game. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to lose to my child because that'll make, but here, here's the thing though. Then like one day they go and like, they go, oh, I know how to play checkers. And they, I play it all the time with my dad. And then they go and play it with a kid in like, you know, I don't know, first grade or second grade or something like that. And they get absolutely stomped or like laughed because they're like, that's not how the rules even close to work. Even better when they do finally win. They actually feel it. Right. Yeah. They like when my it. daughter oh, beats me, she's like, they I it. beat dad. I'm they like, earned it. Yeah. yeah. Dad's good. Dad's not, dad's not some chump. <laughs> yeah. You know, who dad's the end boss. Yeah. I, yeah. I have yes. never yes. lost to my daughter in tic tac toe. Yeah. Yeah. And I never will. Yeah. Um, and, dad's game. Bitch. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So I think, I think the, 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 the net net there is, you know, if, if players never feel like they, you know, and hopefully your players are probably a lot more intelligent than a five year old. You know, but if the if the players never feel like they earned their victory, if they always feel like it's being given to them, yeah, it just robs it of that every goes back to fudging. Yeah, yeah it goes I mean, back yeah. to fudging. Yeah. yeah, I got a random random one. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, random, but uh, this is like I got multiple parts. But um, what's your <laughs> what's your favorite house rule that you ever did? What was the rule it took over, and why did you do it? So my favorite house rule. Oh, I didn't know if you're gonna have the answer right away. Oh, I know the answer. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so the my favorite house rule that I ever did was we ran in uh, Pathfinder First Edition. We ran a dungeon called Dragon's Delve. And this was a huge twenty level plus sub levels mega dungeon. It went all the way from the top to the bottom. And you know Pathfinder One goes from one to twenty. And generally speaking, level one of the dungeon was made for level one characters, and level two of the dungeon was made for level two characters, and vice versa down the line. And the dungeon had a lot of cool, interesting things to it. And at the bottom of the dungeon was an evil, colossal, gargantuan red dragon, ancient red dragon named Metarak. But Dungeon and Dragons games have a problem. They have this problem whether you're playing a dungeon-based game or whether you're playing a very story or narrative-based game, which is you have a certain number of resources per day. Hit points spells, special abilities, magical items. And when those run out, what do you do then, right? So if you're in a story-based game and you're fighting your way through the castle and, you know, you're losing hit points and you're losing spells and you get to the end and you, you know, you slam open the door just in time to see the, you know, the prince waving from the back of a, of a carriage, help me, as he, you know, gets raced off into the night and you're like, we need to follow him. And you're like, um... We're kind of low on hit points and spells, dude. I I think we should take a break. We should go back to town. <laughs> or, or you're in a dungeon and it's just an ancient hole in the ground from which they say few remain. Now there's no princess to be captured. You know, you're just like, what what's in the earth? You know, when you're a kid, why do you go exploring? Because it's cool. You know, you're like, what's what what lies for me in the depths? Wealth, power, magic. Cool. So you go in to this ancient room where no one has been for a hundred years and you fight some goblins. You know, you, you take a couple points of damage. You kind of look around and you go, I think we should just go back to town, get a good night's sleep, come back tomorrow when we're well rested. All full. So you go back to the dungeon where no one has been for a hundred years except for you yesterday. And then you go one more room. Oh my gosh. There's some evil imps. Spellcasters just cast every spell they have, kill them all evenly. And they're like, that was cool. And you're like, yeah, I'm out of spells though, dude. We should, we should just go back to town and rest. So you do. This is called the 15 minute adventuring day. It was a problem in earlier editions of the game. And what I did for Dragon's Delve is I created a system because carrots are better than sticks. Now, nothing I'm about to say forces the players to continue on. But here was the, it was really simple. This is a Pathfinder first edition game. The game assumes that in a given adventuring day with your resources and your hit points, you were able to take on four fights with what you have of appropriate balance. My rule was every time you fight four fights, 
the there's like a a, a, a counter that goes up that a says multiplier a multiplier that says okay you guys have fought in four fights the game says you fought in four fights and you've done your you should go back to town and rest but if you stick around in this dungeon I'm gonna give you twenty five percent more experience and. 25% more treasure and a chance for even better, cooler treasure. Oh, so it wasn't just like a house or it was like almost like a modification. Right. And now if you did, but if you did six encounters, now it's a 50% bonus with a 50% bonus for treasure with an even greater chance for cool, unique, special so magic they want to grind. <laughs> so we they, did not rest much. <laughs> right. And so now, because if you go back to town every time you fight, the game's really easy. So is this sort of what you, why you went to the resolve that route is, that's in correct. PF2? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. That's correct. I was. I mean, I love the resolve thing. I just uh, didn't know where it... Yeah, I use the resolve rules because I didn't want you as a party to be like, we want to do the cool, heroic, epic narrative thing, but the game rules are saying, I'm out of spells and I'm out of hit points and I need to go mm -hmm. spend a, a day resting at the end to get back my spells or we have to spend two and a half hours making medicine checks on each other in the middle of a... Goblin Fortress, which makes no sense at all. Hang on, guys. Right. Don't attack us. We're healing. Yeah, Hold don't, on, don't attack us, yeah. please. We're healing. We're healing. <laughs> Instead, as, as Tim pointed out, in that Dragon's Delve game, my heroes, the party, would push themselves to the absolute limit. I love it. Because they want, you know, it's like when you play a game, you, you load up a video game, you know, like a Diablo game. You could pick easy, but why do you pick a higher order difficulty? Because you want the challenge. Mm -hmm. you can, and to your point, the better loot. And the better loot. And I know Tim, he wanted that better loot. Ever My favorite thing in <laughs> life is leveling up <laughs> and getting new shit. Yeah. All right, like in games, in my actual life, <laughs> like if I could gain a level somehow, I absolutely fucking would. I would sell my soul for D and D levels. I don't know. Let me be a fucking wizard. But yeah, and, yeah, and, that's and, what I like to do. Yeah, and so, so in that game, I created an experience point system because experience point systems, in my belief, I know, I know, we're using milestones in Rise of the Rune Lords doing that because it's easy and it's convenient. We have new players and it's easy, but I do not like them. And I'll tell you why. I don't like them because I want to be able to reward the players for taking the actions that they wanted to take. And experience points are the way that you communicate to your players that this is what is valuable in my game, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to encourage the players rather than railroading them, simply say, this is worth more experience than that. And uh, another good instance of what Derek did in that campaign for this was pretty much every floor, if not every floor, had what he called a hoard. And it was a secret treasure. You had to figure out clues and get through magical traps and a lot of other secret stuff to obtain these treasures. But it was worth it. So that was a very strong reason for us to pay a lot of attention to context clues not skip much, take notes. Like it say, really kept us engaged. That's what I like. I think it not only was like, oh, we're just gonna do our four fights and go back to town, but if we go to five, we go to six, you all of a sudden everyone at the table, they're getting in. Yeah. They're mm -hmm. getting involved. Well, because right. what, can, what can we do to make sure we can get to five? Right. Get to six. Yeah. Right. Because you start, I want that treasure. Right. Because you start playing better, you start making more creative That's decisions. That's a really good right. And sometimes people they would even strategize it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like they would go like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We will go and we'll, we'll fight four fights and, you know, that are challenging. And then we'll be in the ex bonus experience. But then we'll find, we'll take the secret passage that we found that takes us down to the next level. And then while we're at the bonus experience, we'll fight the even harder stuff. Oh, gosh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so that, was, that was my question is, theoretically, you, you scaled level one, was yep. level one, level Correct. two, and so on. Yep. So when you start to introduce the bonus you're tipping the scale into the player's favors, right? Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. you could be... But that's the beauty of it, Nick, because here's the thing. You're absolutely right. You're, you could break the characters, right? Because they could get way more experience and way more treasure than they were ever supposed to have. Mm -hmm. And so you might have a, we'll call them a, a level one party. Well, maybe they level up. They're a level two party. And you're like, oh, they'll go to level two. But they have like enough powerful gear and magical items that they could take on level four challenges. But in my dungeon, it's like, okay, then skip level two and three and just go straight to four. If you want to be challenged, go find the dungeon level that challenges you. We also had the opposite effects. Sometimes only two players would show up. 
and the party was level eight, they had skipped level five. So they went back to do level So there's five. only two of them. They go, you want to just go on to level five and just <laughs> roll house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I were at that session. <laughs> yeah. <I can't. laughs> because it no, sounded no, epic. No, no, that session did happen, you know? Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, I, I kind of do. Yeah. You know? Or like everyone shows up and they're like, you know what, man? I know we were going to go to, you know, we're like a level nine Fine party. Off. <laughs> yeah. We're a level nine party. You know, I know we were going to try to tackle level 10 tonight. I had a rough week at work. You know, kids were being, I kind of just wanted this like, mm, just smash face. Murder hobo. Murder hobo. <laughs> can we, can we go back to that part of level seven that we never really explored and just destroy, destroy it. it? Oh, but it won't, nothing you fight will be on challenge, dude. After the week I've had at work. I don't, yeah. the word yeah. challenge does not want to exist in my vocabulary, <laughs> yeah. you know? I just want to be like, I'm like, oh, they flee before your might. And you're like, they didn't, they're not fast enough. I killed them. I catch them, <laughs> right. I catch them all. I win initiative <laughs> and I hurt <laughs> them down. <Yeah. laughs> I, I'm sorry. They they do not survive. You know, like, like you can just feel the stress melting away as your fireball just burns them all to a crisp, you know, or, or you just kill three monsters in three swings of your sword, you know? You're like, hmm, yes. Yeah. And now good. here's the breath run. You're like, but Derek, doesn't that get boring? It does. And then as soon as it gets boring, you, you go, go back, back to the, the challenge. You go back to the harder challenge. See, that's where it's a different dynamic. The sandbox. It, and that is a sandbox. Yeah. Right. It, and, it, it, and it gives everything an option to do. It's a yeah. constrained sandbox because it's the dungeon. You got to stay in the dungeon. But the dungeon is huge. Each level is massive. You know, can, could take, you know, d days and days and days of play to go through. But you've created a sandbox where the players pick the challenge, not the game master. You know, and then our next in our next uh, Rise of the Rune Lord session, you guys are going to have to fight a fortress full of giants, and it's going to be really tough. What if you're like, ah, I kind of don't want a tough fight. I want a tougher fight, <laughs> you know, or I want a easier fight, or I want a this or that. Sandboxes let you kind of pick and choose. So you mentioned how you always like to prepare one session ahead. Yeah. So in a perfect example is that like, okay, guys, I had a bad day at work. I don't want to go to level 10 that you may have prepared for. Yeah. So how did you handle where it's like, shit, they want to go to level five because there's two of them. Yeah. You know, did you already have every kind of level prepped out ahead well, of time? Or? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the, the goal is in the beginning, right? You you always have to pay a little bit of a dividend, right? Like you have to do some work before your campaign begins so that you have maybe, uh, you know, a couple of sessions worth. When I say that I don't prepare for a session in advance, what I mean is I don't assume the party members are going to take any action more than one session in advance. So what I mean to say for that is if the group says, okay, next level or next time we are going to go after the beholder on level 10. Okay. I'm going to assume the party's going to go after the beholder on level 10. I am not going to think about anything that they're, I'm not going to assume that they are going to do anything. I'm not going to assume, oh, and then after they kill the beholder, they're going to find that the beholder was actually a servant of this villain and then they're going to go after that villain and no i just assume okay you guys are going after the villain you're going after the beholder i'll make sure that i have my notes up to date that i've read them if it's an adventure path or something pre-written i've read them i've up to date with them and I, that way i'm informed and i can make decisions and uh if so i would say that one of the keys of sandbox play the players can't make their mind up when they show up that day Okay, so this you knew that that they were going to do that ahead of time. Yeah, like, a little yeah. bit of adult. Yeah, you got to have adult. <laughs> you got to have a little bit of you know that that this is something that someone brought up in a comment um, uh, on our video about sandbox versus uh, adventures, which is there's a social contract here, right? Uh, a, a, a GM is not a computer, nor are they they a a you know team of professional adventure writers. They cannot. Uh, think of everything on the fly instantaneously, especially if you're playing a more complex game with maps and it monsters and all sorts of stats. You you kind of have to give them a heads up. So if the party shows up and goes, bro, we had a rough week of work. We want to just go to level five and kick ass. And the DM goes, uh, I don't really have level five prepped. You guys want to go to level four instead? Okay, fine, cool. We'll go to level four. You know? Yeah. Okay. You know, you just got to, you know. Like I said, we always got to be adults about this. Right. And, and yeah. just, you have a social contract that the players go, okay, listen, we get it. You know, the, the GM is not. Yeah. They're up. not I omnip am doing omnipotent. Five. <laughs> right. But I think one of the advantages that you have of a dungeon, uh, something I do like about dungeons, is it is a sandbox. You know, party can do anything, go anywhere, except it's a dungeon. So they can't. It's still confined. It's defined by a dungeon is either a room or a passageway or it's not. It's just solid earth. You know, contrast that with like you're in a city, hundreds and streets, thousands of buildings and businesses, or the wilderness. Go anywhere. In a dungeon, you can only go somewhere if 
it exists. And so on one hand, you say, I have limited the choices that you can make. You can only go to one of these 48 rooms, but you can go to any of the 48 rooms and you can go to them in any order you want and in any way you shape or form you please. If you want to seal off a room, if you want to fill it full of alchemist fire and burn it, you know, you know, to the ground, cool. But I don't, you know, I don't have, I don't care what you do. I just, you just, you're limited in what you can do in the sense of with whatever's in the dungeon, that's what you can do. Yeah. Right. And that's why in Dungeons and Dragons, that's why it's in the name. You know, it was a very useful tool for giving the players free reign in a constrained space. Well, people don't know what dungeons are anymore. That is true. <laughs> I mean, the way I always look at it is imagine chess, the game, but now it's being played on an infinite grid, right? <laughs> And your pieces still move within <laughs> the rules of the pieces. Right. It, it's this normal chess setup. Yeah, but that's not right. a dungeon if it's infinite. Well, no, that's why a dungeon is the chessboard. There are literally, oh, okay, there, are literally right, there are literally okay. more chess positions than I there are. Them out, I was like, yeah. Wait, there are literally more far? chess positions than there are particles in the yeah, universe. Try chasing my king down now, bitch. Right, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You're like, you're like, where's your queen move? Um 10, 20, 20, 20 22,000 squares yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just so so a chessboard is limited. There's only 64 squares. But the positions are almost infinite and the variety is almost infinite. So you have whatever – it's chess. Make whatever move you want to make first. But it has to be within this eight by right. eight grid. And the confines of how they can move. Exactly. Correct. And yeah. that, and so a chessboard is like a dungeon. I like that. Yeah. So cool. Nice. All right. Well, we just did a short one today because uh, you know we're recording a couple of these episodes so that we can get more content out to you, our viewers. Thanks to our patrons who have been supporting us. Big Jabroni, Pierre, Dr. Mac, Charles Hemsworth, Aaron Smith, and Ross Lupo. Their support is allowing us to make a couple more videos a week, and so we hope to get more of these out to you. You guys have responded well to the nightlife, and we really appreciate that. Uh, leave a like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy our content and you wish to see more. Any uh, follow-ups from the from the fellow knights? No, I'm ready to uh, tackle this uh, AP next time we get all together. Yeah, if you if you're a fan of uh, of our adventure path, Rise of the Rune Lords, I recommend that you uh, you know go ahead and you check out some of our past episodes. But schedules have been kind of crazy. We've had a couple people sick, and uh, we really want to have all members of the knights here for the big fight at Fort Rannick versus the uh, Giants of the Krieg clan. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get an adventure path out this week, but we are, are hoping to get that out to you all soon, and we really appreciate you being patient with us. So for the Knights of Last Call, my name is Derek Melinda saying welcome to the Knights of Last Call. Mm -hmm.